Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Leontech's Revolution Day. For those of you who weren't here last year, my name is Ellen Fraunknecht. I work as a business journalist and TV anchor in Germany, and I'm very honored. I may once again guide you through this very exciting event. It's the seventh year that this event is uh, being held, and while some aspects remain unchanged, the beautiful location, us being once again one step ahead of the World Economic Forum in Davos, definitely in terms of timing, possibly even in terms of content. Uh, once again, the say also aims to establish and intensify dialogue between academia and investors. Uh, yet a few things are different this year. EFG has been renamed and is now called Leontech, an evolution you will be able to hear more about in just a second. And uh, while we don't want to go as far as to call for a revolution in Switzerland uh, this year, what we do want to do is uh, call about the revolu talk about the revolutionary transformations of how we live, communicate, and do business. Let me give you two very overwhelming numbers. At the beginning of this year, worldwide safe data volume amounted to two zeta bytes. That's a two with 21 zeros, equivalent to two trillion bytes. Okay, perhaps still hard to imagine. How about this one? If all existing data of mankind were to be saved on iPads, and uh, these iPads would be piled up, this pile would actually be as high as a Chinese wall is long, 21,000 kilometers. And uh, if we were to produce and save data at the same speed, uh, this pile, this iPad wall, would actually go once around the globe in two years from now. Uh, that's quite astonishing. And uh, we will hear more astonishing facts today from a number of very distinguished experts who are here to help you fully understand how new technologies shape your businesses and uh, how they shape the one of your competitors. For all of this to work, please do challenge what our speakers are telling you today. Do think critically for yourself. Most importantly, ask questions if you have any. This is a terrific opportunity to get first-hand advice and business solutions from some of the most experienced experts in this field. So, Let's try to make this interactive and not just a series of lectures. But first of all, let me introduce to you someone who is the CEO and founder of a company whose secret to success is, according to him, modern computer systems. There you go. He believes that technology is actually his company's uh, critical competitive advantage. I personally have a suspicion it's not only that, because there must be other reasons for why he was recently voted Entrepreneur of the Year in Ernst & Young's category Emerging Entrepreneurs. Congratulations and welcome Jan Schoch, CEO of Leontech. So welcome everybody and thank you very much for coming all. This is, in fact, our first day as Leon Tech, and it's our sixth day up here in the Dolder Grand. And of course, we cannot call it EFGFP Day anymore, and therefore we thought about a new name, and we did come up with the name Revolution Day. Revolution Day, in fact, is a big name, for sure. But actually, we want to live up to it and give you today an event which is unique and different to what you have seen and probably been invited to in the past. We want to look forward and see how the future is going to develop and actually use that as a guidance how we should act ourselves. Leon Tech had an active year last year again, as you certainly have seen. We have started a cooperation with Raiffeisen Notenstein. They took over the stake from EFG International, the remaining one. We have renamed to Leon Tech to underline the Swissness and the technological aspect of our business. Nevertheless, making sound investment decisions and getting valuable insights for that is part of our daily business with our clients. Today, we want to combine both of these and actually want to look at trends and developments in technology, social media, and internet. And we want to present to you new views and interesting insights for your daily life as investors 
as clients and as partners of ours. In the morning session, we are very pleased to announce Daniel Siegberg from Google, who is actually going to present about how to manage technology in a connected society. After the break, we'll have Professor Martin Gross of Complexium talking about the internet and the intelligence of Swarm and how we can use that to make intelligent investment decisions or support respective uh, decisions by looking at users' activity of the Swarm. Then, Dr. David Bosshart of the Gottlieb Dudweiler Institute is going to look at how work, life, and products are going to change, a very big topic, obviously. And our keynote speaker, Sir T Tim Berners-Lee, is going to present in the afternoon. He will give us insight into how to adapt and prepare for the new area of technology and innovation. In the round table, we will look at, or better said, the respective speakers, what will drive and impact society and economy of today. As you have seen, Adam Faunknecht again is our host of today. With that, thank you very much all for coming. Let's enjoy the day together. Thank you. Okay, let's get started. Our first speaker has his finger firmly on the pulse of the digital age, literally. At some point, his wife started calling him glowworm because his face was always illuminated by some kind of screen by lying in bed. I guess that's what happens when you marry a geek and a Googler, his words, not mine. Now, he actually started out as a technology reporter and worked for the likes of CBS, CNN, ABC News and BBC News America. He at one point was nominated for an Emmy Award and also won numerous other awards. In 2011, however, he joined Google, where he now has the media outrage team, is a senior manager and an official spokesperson. So while he clearly loves technology, uh, being suddenly called a glowworm or nicknamed glowworm, he uh, thought it was time to uh, reconsider some of his digital relationships. Uh, and uh, so he thought it was perhaps time to go on a diet, on a digital diet. That's the title of his book, The Digital Diet, The Four-Step Plan to Break Your Tech Addiction and Regain Balance in Your Life. It's about seeking digital moderation without sacrificing anything along the way. There's plenty of research in the book that looks of how today's consumer and customer is coping with the onslaught of technology and how best to position any product. And on the corporate side, he encourages businesses to reconsider how to get the most productivity and efficiency out of their employees without actually driving them into the ground. So in a nutshell, he can help you turn yourself into a high-powered, high-efficiency communicator of the 21st century. Who wouldn't want to be that? Now, he came all the way from New York via Tokyo, but uh, given the latest weather reports from New York, I trust Switzerland now feels like the Caribbean to him. Uh, let's hear him talk about a very hot topic, how we can manage technology in a connected society. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Daniel Seberg. Thank you so much, Alan. <laughs> All right. Guten Tag. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out today. And of course, thank you to Leon Tech for, for hosting me this morning. Um, I, I, I want to begin by assuring you that a digital diet does not mean a digital fast. Um, I'm not going to ask any of you to totally disconnect. I know we all love our technologies for different reasons. But I hope that what, comes, what you come away with today is a, a better idea of how you can do this effectively and do it in a way that's beneficial for your business, for your clients, and for yourself, and hopefully maybe even for your families as well. So I, I have traveled around a lot. Um, part of this is to do with my job at Google. Um, part of it is to do with work for the book, and, and the rest is to do with my own love of travel. And everywhere that I go, I encounter this kind of thread through people who love their technology, that they, they feel that sometimes it overwhelms them to a point where they don't like it as much as they want to. So they have this kind of 
odd relationship with it. They, they want it, they want their devices, they want to stay connected. Of course, they have the demands of the business world or their family or whatever it is, but then they feel overwhelmed and they say, ah, God, that phone again or another message again. And so, unfortunately, it tends to sort of turn something that we absolutely adore into something that we hate. And, and that, to me, is totally counterproductive. So, my hope is that throughout this morning and, and after you leave today, you think about your relationship with technology, what it does to your ability to communicate, your ability to be yourself, your identity online, offline, and that it improves all of that in terms of your own well-being. So, this is me being kind of overwhelmed by technology. Uh, the, the origins of the book, just to give you some context, were mainly because I was feeling totally overwhelmed and addicted. I was a technology reporter, as, as Ellen mentioned. I was in, ingesting, if you will, as much technology as I possibly could. I was super connected on social media. I had every latest device. Um, I absolutely was immersed in technology, as much as any human being possibly could. Um, but what I realized at one point towards the end of 2009, I was back home visiting my family, and they were telling me things that were happening in their life, these seminal moments like possibly getting uh, divorced, my stepbrother was getting divorced, uh, my father was getting married, uh, another friend was pregnant, and I didn't know any of these things. And I thought, how is that possible? I'm, I'm totally connected here. I, I, you're, you're all in my social media networks. Well, why don't I know these things? And, and the reality is that I had become a terrific broadcaster and a terrible communicator. And I'd lost the ability to really have that two-way exchange with people. And it was the beginning of me realizing that I had a problem. Uh, and that there needed to almost be this kind of digital intervention uh, where I think my friends and my family members were a little concerned that they never saw me anymore. I was also playing this game World of Warcraft. I don't know if anybody here plays online role-playing games. Anyone going to admit? No? Nope. Oh, yep, I cut. Thank you. Um, and, and so I really had kind of lost my way with technology. So it was the beginning of me rethinking what all of that meant. I also started looking around at some of the, the products that are out there these days uh, and, and the stuff that helps us to manage our technology. I thought, wow, this is the world that we live in. Uh, so here, here is, on the left there is a device that will help a, in this case, a young child to be able to look up at their smartphone without even having to hold it. So you can just sort of stare up at the screen comfortably lying in bed. Uh, and on the right uh, is the young lady who's wearing something called a cell phone wrist holder. So this is an actual product. It's in that SkyMall magazine, if you've seen it in the back of your seat pocket on an airplane. Uh, and the idea is that if you're talking on your phone so much you start to develop pain in your wrist, this will actually help alleviate that pain. So, th you know, th this is the kind of stuff that's, that's out there for people who really feel like they have a problem with this stuff um, and, and want to deal with it. So, it, it, it sort of bleeds into lots of areas of our society, right? I mean, how many of us have been in a scenario similar to this one where the majority of the people sitting around at a business lunch, let's say, and most people are pulling out their device and looking at it? Yes? A few nodding heads? Okay. I, I've heard that there's sort of a minimal, people don't feel guilty if they see at least two other people not looking at their devices, so they feel like they have permission to pull theirs out, because, well, there are two other people who are talking, so we're all still having a conversation here. But this is the kind of stuff that happens in more and more places around the world, and I'm sure we've all experienced it to some capacity. You might even see people like this who are so engrossed in their device. I was in Tokyo the other day, and a woman, this guy almost got run over because he was just so immersed in his device that this car just almost took him right out. Um, and so even at the expense of someone's life, they can't quite put their devices down for a minute, um, which I think is extraordinary. Um, and then you get you know, date situations like this where both people are sitting there on their devices. I've seen cases where the two people were actually texting each other sitting at the table. And I think, well, what, what's the point? Like, why are you even out 
in public if you're just going to sit there on your device the whole entire time. Now, part of the, the research in the book and part of the reason that I'm here to talk to you today and that I hope this is going to resonate with you from a, from a business standpoint is that this is affecting how we communicate, uh, how we identify ourselves. You know, a couple of my contemporaries, Nick Carr and Clive Thompson, have written books. You could argue that they're competing books. One of them looks at or, or, you know, Nick suggests that technology is making us dumber, that we're not as able to recall facts or understand uh, navigation through maps because we're so reliant on our technology. On the other hand, Clive Thompson argues, no, 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 we're actually becoming smarter because of all this. We can access all this information really quickly. We're actually empowered as a human being. And I would say that, you know, I guess I fall somewhere in the middle, which I hope is, is of interest to people because on the one hand you're arguing that human beings are not quite as intelligent as they used to be. On the other hand, I think Clive is almost talking about sort of a cyborg future where we have this merging of man and machine. And my hope, and I'm, in many ways I'm excited about that idea. I just don't want us to lose our humanity along the way. So there's kind of, I realize there are sort of competing ideas going on here, but it's all going to factor into your lives, your children's lives, and, and in fact, one, one of the people I talked to for the book was a neurosurgeon in, in Washington, D.C. named Richard Restack. And he is looking at what this is doing to the actual neurons firing in our brain and how it's, in his words, he's saying we're being re-sculpted, that the brain is being re-sculpted. That the way that we process information, the way that we respond, the way that we want to get feedback from people very quickly, all of that is actually rewiring how our brains work. Now that's us in this room, we're all roughly from sort of the same generations, plural, but if you think of course of young people, my daughters are very, very young, but if you think of that next generation, what is it doing to their brain? How they consume technology? Now some of us, we wring our hands, we worry, Oh, they're, they're, they're going to be lost to the digital age. They're not going to understand what it means to have a conversation anymore. Um, and, and we worry about what that's doing. On the other hand, of course, we know next generation is always different. This happens throughout the course of history. And if you do have concerns about your kids and you see them with this kind of pattern of behavior, I would suggest to you that you also look at your own behavior because kids, of course, emulate what they see. So if your kids are always picking up their phone, maybe think about how you might always be picking up your phone in conversation with them. You know, I had a woman who, uh, a TV executive, who she retold this story to me, and I, I was quite moved by it. She said that she went in one night to check on her five-year-old son who was writhing about in bed. He was having night terrors, and she went in to try to console him and was sort of stroking his head. And in his sleep, this five-year-old said, Mommy, Mommy, put the Blackberry down. And it was this epiphany for her, this realization that her behavior was affecting her child this strongly and that she needed to adjust what she was doing despite all the demands from her business. This is a, this is a top level executive who needed to be connected for lots of different reasons, no question, but at what expense to the relationship with that child. And this is the same kind of thing that I think happens in a lot of our lives, whether it's our spouse, our children, our coworkers, whatever it is, that is being affected. Same goes for your health. So uh, maybe some of you can relate to some, one of these pictures. You feel like you can't put your phone down. You know, you're up late at night. You're not getting any sleep. Uh, <laughs> I'll mention my nickname, Glowworm, because my wife was always seeing me illuminated by some kind of screen, which I can assure you is not good for marital relations uh, in the bedroom. It just doesn't help anything. Um, so sometimes putting those devices away uh, can actually benefit you in other ways too. Um, but that kind of lack of sleep, if you think of yourself from a productivity standpoint, and, and I get a lot of business people, I do talks with business people all the time, and many of them afterwards will say, you just don't get it, Seberg. I have to be connected all the time. You know, I have business deals in different parts of the world. I need to have my phone with me at the ready. If I miss that deal, I am screwed. I'm like, okay, all right, look. 
you have to start thinking about priorities. If you want to stay up until 2 o'clock in the morning and respond to emails, and your coworkers are going to see the timestamp on that email, and they're going to wonder, why is this guy up that late? Like, what, can't he just relax for a few minutes? And on the other hand, if you're not sleeping well, you don't feel 100%, you can't be as good as you can be, then you might make some bad decisions the next day. And as a result, that great business deal or whatever it was that you were working on could fall apart because you're not at your best. So I say to you, there's a choice here. And there's a, an increasing amount of research being done about how we as human beings can only tolerate so much screen time right before we're trying to get into that REM sleep. And if you can't give yourself half an hour, an hour, or even two hours before you fall asleep, your brain is still running on that treadmill, and it's not allowing you to get that kind of restful sleep. Now, nobody is perfect at this, and I am certainly not. But I suggest to you that at times, when you do have something important the next day, or when you've got you know, a real opportunity to take advantage of that sleep, it is like those janitors in your brain cleaning up everything that's in there, all that mess. So another point to illustrate kind of how far we've come and how fast and, and sort of how this has happened, uh, the image at the top, 2005, with uh, Pope Benedict at the Vatican, 2013, Pope Francis. And you can see the pervasion of smartphones and digital devices at both of these occasions. That's only in eight years. And you think about what's coming. What's, hap what's coming in eight years from now? If we all own a smartphone, that's done. So what's after that? And some people might say, well, wearable technology. Um, maybe it's going to be implanted in our head. Maybe it's going to be integrated more into our lives. I think that no, unquestionably, it's going to become more seamless. It's going to become just second nature to us. Gesture computing, wearable technology, all of this becoming very seamlessly integrated in our lives. Now that's great and really exciting. As I mentioned before, I work at Google, I love technology, yes. However, I think that with that seamlessness, there's less of a distinction between online and offline. It becomes a part of us, right? So it used to be you would log on to the internet, you would log off. It was a very finite experience. So as it becomes more a part of our lives, and we don't even have to think so much about getting information and, and making these choices, that's where I hope that we're asking these critical questions. I don't have all the answers. I don't know anybody who does. But I think that it's important at this stage that we start thinking about these things. So I actually have, at this point, I, I want to ask everybody here to help me out, okay? I know it's the morning, it's the first session, Everybody's kind of like, you know, just getting warmed up here, but I need your help, okay? So I need everybody to take out their smartphone. Just take it out of your pocket. I know everyone, is, everybody's always so reluctant when I ask this. It's right there. Just take it out, hold it up. Just hold it up like those people in the picture with the Pope, okay? Just hear, hear me out here. Take it out. Just hold it in your hand. I see, okay, okay, yes, 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 good, good. Okay, excellent. Now pass it to the person next to you. Just hand it over to them. Okay, don't look at anybody's photos. <laughs> I can almost hear the internal monologues going on here. Did I send that last email? Does this mean I can't finish my game of Candy Crush? If you haven't played Candy Crush, you're missing out. Now, the reason that I do this is that it's about thinking critically about the relationship with that device. So when you passed it off or when you thought about handing it off, you probably had a quick mix of a bunch of feelings, right? Fear, <laughs> apprehension, nervousness, uh, sort of embarrassed, like, oh, don't judge my device. It's the latest one for sure. <laughs> but you, maybe you even felt some sense of relief because for just a few seconds, you didn't have to think about what was going on in that device. But the bottom line is that it probably felt a little bit like giving part of yourself away, almost like an extension of your body, right? Because our devices, especially our smartphones, they contain so much of our lives. It's our email. In many ways, you know, we see so many trends these days with BYOD, bring your own device to work, right? So people in, in offices now have personal and professional on the same device. You have your photos. 
you have your contacts, you have texts, you have your social media, it's your friends, it's your family, it's you, it's your identity, it's everything. And people who panic when they lose their device, forget about everything else. This is a guy who recently fell into the, a freezing cold river in Chicago, I want to say. He died trying to get his cell phone, okay? That, that, that was more important to him than staying dry and not dying. This is the world that we live in. The other thing that I want to point out in terms of a business context and in the financial world, and that's uh, John Kerry up there, who you all know, uh, Secretary of State. And one of the things, this is an, a recent article that looked at, um, it was Sherry Turkle, who at MIT talks a lot about this, and the idea of saving the art of the conversation. So how many of you, I hope, can recall a recent conversation in a business context that was really meaningful? It was useful. I hope you all can, because I think we can agree that that can be one of the most important aspects of any business interaction. The way that you converse with somebody, the eye contact. You know, in, the, in this age of constant partial attention, where we're always distracted by something, maybe the biggest gift that you can give to somebody is your attention, is just a little bit of an opportunity to show them that they matter. And in a, in a business setting, I think that the idea of a conversation, and this is something that I talk to, especially with, with young people when I talk to students, and I say, you know, look, you, you, you're, you can be the most, you can, be the, you can write the best email to your boss ever, and it may, it, I almost guarantee you, it will get you no further ahead than if you go down and talk to him or her and have a quality conversation with them. And I made this mistake. This is something that I used to do in a business sense. I kind of hid behind my screen a lot. And I was, I think that's partly why I got so into technology. I was, I, I was just, I was an awkward person, kid growing up. I didn't sort of fit in and I couldn't have conversations very well. And it ended up kind of biting me in the ass a little bit in the business world because I couldn't get out of my shell. I couldn't get away from the screens as much as I loved them. And so I hope that that's something that you think about in the, in the business sense as you talk to your clients, as you talk to other customers, remembering that those conversations, they matter. They really do. It's the kind of stuff that people remember. You know, we all kind of forget an email we get here and there. But those conversations, that opportunity to make eye contact and see people face to face, it's still extremely powerful, even in today's age. And I mentioned that guy who fell into the river. Here's another woman. This was in, uh, in Australia who was checking her Facebook status and she was so engrossed in her screen that she just walked right into the ocean. <laughs> Which, I mean, I, to me, these are all examples of that kind of need to find the balance in everything that we do. Now, lest you think, by the way, that, and I'm sure that some of you are sitting there thinking, how on earth does a guy at Google come here and talk to me about moderating technology? Uh, this is a, obviously what could seem to be a, a, a contradiction. I assure you that it's not. There, are, there is a growing number of people at Google, yes, but across the tech industry, thinking about all of this and how we do it the right way. So this is uh, Ariana Huffington, who, of, of course, from the Huffington Post, and she is a, a very strong proponent of all of this. I got a chance to meet her in New York uh, last year. I was helping to produce a conference at Google called Wisdom 2.0. And if you haven't, if you're ever in the Bay Area uh, in San Francisco, that's mostly where they happen. They're often sold out. But it is a group of technologists. You get a, you get a CEO of LinkedIn sitting next to a Buddhist practitioner, sitting next to the head of a Kickstarter or a startup. You know, you get this real cross-section of people from across the tech landscape, the financial industry, yes, the sort of spiritual and religious side as well, but everybody just trying to figure out how to do this the right way. And I think it's increasingly becoming a part of the conversation. There's a colleague of mine at Google named Chad Meng Tang, and he wrote a book called Search Inside Yourself, and it's all about finding that kind of zen-like approach to technology. This is an engineer who's been, he's one of the original employees at Google. And he actually runs this program at Google. It's sold out. 
for people to kind of understand how we do this the right way. So that, I just point that out as something to think about. Uh, LG did a, a study recently, and I wanted to share, you, share with you some of the results because I thought they were interesting. Now, this, is, this was published in CIO Insight, so Chief Information Officer Insight. So, you know, tech publication aimed at folks like yourself. This is not, uh, you know, in some sort of touchy-feely magazine. The result here, so divided attention, 58% of people uh, admitted that they pulled out the smartphone during quality time uh, with the family, and 62% have done the same thing around friends. So that instinct, that tendency to kind of want to pull out our, our device. 28% uh, have used it during a romantic encounter of some kind. Um, maybe they were bored, maybe they just didn't like the person, whatever it was. 35% um, admitted to... <laughs> talking on their smartphone or pretending to use it to avoid talking to someone else. Anybody here want to admit that they have done this at some point? Okay, hopefully not today. Um, but of course, we end up kind of using it as a, a crutch or an excuse sometimes. 41% uh, have revealed that they've used it as a way to uh, glean sort of instant enlightenment so they didn't have to appear that they didn't know anything about something during a conversation. Uh, maybe they use Google uh, to look something up. Um, and this is where that kind of argument between the Nick Cars of the world and the Clive Thompsons who sort of say, well, w on the one hand, you know, our, our human brains are perhaps not as good at, at getting those facts out or remembering something. On the other hand, you have instant access to the world's information at your fingertips and you have this great knowledge that's there for you anytime that you want it. So, you know, I, I'm, I am open to the debate here. I mean, I am not suggesting that we all have to agree, but I think it's interesting to kind of think about those two worlds. This is another uh, study that looks at what people were, when they were willing to be interrupted. So during a meeting, 22%, and by the way, the green under 25, the blue over 25. So you can see a bit of a disparity between the two different age groups. Uh, during a meal, more people under 25 were okay being interrupted during a meal. Um, don't like interruptions. You can see many more people over 25 don't want to be interrupted. They would rather just be focused on whatever it is that they're doing. And the one that I just couldn't help but highlighting is this one. I just still don't quite understand. Uh, but that, that it's okay to be interrupted during sex. Now, I know this, everybody kind of has this nervous laugh when I show this, but, it's like, but this is what's happening here. And... I'm not quite sure how they define sex in the study, uh, but anyway, you can sort of, you get the idea, um, you know, in terms of what we're willing to, to do. This is another study from Bournemouth University they looked at. They asked 150 students, they said, take uh, um, just 24 hours off email and texting and your smartphone and social media. That's it, just 24, just one, one day, okay? And 11% felt some sort of uh, isolation, uh, feelings of distress, um, and my favorite is that some of them actually just kept their mobile phones nearby to touch them, almost like a little comfort object. They would just hold it. Even though it was turned off, they just had it in their hand. Couldn't let it go, right? I mean, this is how powerful that relationship is with our technology. So, as we think about, and I, I, think, I thought that this was, was relevant to the idea of the Revolution Day or Evolution Day, um, with that top image there, and when, where is this all headed? Where are we going with this, and how do we feel like we're consuming technology without being consumed by it? Um, and I hope that many of you don't fit into the bottom category there, but I'm sure that some of you do, where even when we try to sleep, we end up dreaming about our technology or about what's on our mind. Um, and in fact, this is a... Uh, a quote here, so I'll just read it out. I fear the day that technology will surpass our human interaction. The world will have a generation of idiots. Except, he never said that. He didn't actually say that. But this quote, this image has been shared around so many times on the internet that people believe it to be true. And they think that it has to be true because we're seeing this kind of happen today. But, you know, he didn't say it but we still kind of feel that way. So, 
the reasons for this kind of moderation, the reasons for thinking about all of this, both from your own personal productivity, your relationships with people, but how about your own safety, okay, or the safety of others? And this is increasingly a big issue in the U.S. The wireless carriers are all united on this. Unfortunately, so many people still do it. They just drive around texting and killing people everywhere they go. They just can't put the devices away. And, you know, it amazes me. And in fact, and, and, you know, this is, I, I know that this is a funny slide, but it can be horribly sad. I interviewed a father whose son was killed by someone who was texting while driving. Now, the person who was texting was not, you know, flirting with their boyfriend or doing anything silly. They were actually texting about a church fundraiser. You know, it was a very altruistic intent, but the result was tragic and, and horrible, and it was very, very sad. So, this is something, you know, as you think about why all of this matters, you know, that's another one. So, okay, how do you get better? How do you, how do, you do all this? And how, hopefully, how do I help? How does the idea of the book help? So, in the course of writing the book, I, I created what, what I call the virtual weight index. So, everybody, maybe you've heard of the BMI or the body mass index, and this is a ratio. It looks at your height and your weight and just comes up with a number that suggests whether you're healthy or somewhat overweight or obese or whatever it is. So, the same concept applies to the virtual weight index. The difference is it's the weight that you can't see. So we all look in the mirror, we all have a, some idea of whether we're kind of not in as good a shape as we want to be, but with our technology, we don't always see it, right? It's off in, in the ether, in the interwebs. You know, we have all these logins and passwords and devices and services and everything else that we feel like enhances our life, and hopefully it does. But if you wonder if it is or it isn't, then I would encourage you to take the virtual weight index. So the Telegraph put together this great interactive where you can go on there, you just answer some questions, put in some numbers, it takes you five minutes, okay? And it will just give you kind of an idea of whether or not this is necessary and how much it might be able to help to kind of think about whether you need all this stuff. And the, the, t the title of the book, The Digital Diet, the reason that I chose that title, and, and you know, you, diet always, you know, people think of food and so on, the fact is that, that our choices with technology in a, in a connected society are much like food. You know, we make decisions when we eat something. There are consequences if we overeat, if we binge, if we consume too much, you know, if we don't eat the right things. Same goes with technology. And I'm, I realize you're, you're all in the finance industry in some way, and there's absolutely an application here. As you think about whether you feel bloated with your technology, what, which services are working well for you, which things should you cut off, you know, just consuming everything mindlessly or applying that to whatever business strategy you're doing is not effective. And, you know, again, yes, I worked at Google. Yes, we want people to use our services. Yes, you know, we, we have lots of different products and we want people to, to be consuming them, but not to the point where they're not effective anymore or they're not working or they're, they're not doing what you want them to do. So I encourage you to think about that. It will come up with this number. Um, 78 is really, really high, so if you get something like that, then you're in trouble. Um, but it, it is a way to just quickly get a sense, and this is, again, from a personal standpoint, but you could think from a business context or from whatever it is your company's doing, what is our strategy here? What, what's working and what's not? And be really critical about that. Don't feel that kind of peer pressure to just buy and, and use anything that comes along because somebody tells you that it's worth doing, you know, what is really effective in your company's strategy and whatever you're doing. So some other things to think about in a, in a business setting and, and ways to kind of manage this a bit better. So the idea of phone stack. If you're out on a, on a business lunch or a business dinner, I would suggest to you on some occasion gather everybody's phones and smartphones and stack them up in the middle of the table, okay? And the first one who pulls their phone out has to pay the bill, <laughs> right? See what happens. Remember that art of the conversation? You know, people having discussions. This will force people to actually make eye contact. 
and, and have a conversation because otherwise, why did you go out? Why are you at this business meeting? Why are you sitting at a table with people if not to talk to them and learn from them? Now, there will be awkward silences and pauses. You might feel a bit weird and, you know, everything's not going to go smoothly. Guess what? That's okay. That's okay. That's called being a human being. So, it's one of those exercises that you might want to think about. Try it just once. Look, I realize it doesn't work all the time. Um, and the other thing that I will say, when I was doing the research for the book, I interviewed a woman named Linda Stone, who is a uh, former executive at Apple and Microsoft and a uh, very high-powered executive. And when I did the interview with her, it was actually at a, at a coffee shop. And I was waiting for her. I was sort of sitting there. And she just came flying in, came, sat down. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Oh, I'm sorry I'm late. Um, look, I'm gonna, I, I, I've got a friend coming from the airport, and uh, they don't know where I am right now, and I'm expecting a call when they land, when they get here. So I'm going to have my phone out on the table in case they call, but aside from that, I want you to know that you have my complete and undivided attention. I was like, okay. <laughs> cool. You didn't have to tell me that, but wait, actually, that's really great that you told me that, because it says to me that I matter. And that, yeah, I understand, you got a friend coming, that's cool, no problem. But it wasn't just sitting there. I mean, all too often what happens is we dump our phones, in the book I call them a tech turd, right? Because we just like dump our phones on the table. They're just there. And you know what they are? They're a guest whose only job <laughs> is to interrupt everything that you're doing. That's pretty much what it is. And so unless you have a compelling reason to pull that out or to reach for it, you know, telling the people that you're with, that's such a strong message to send to your colleague, to your coworker, to your client. Say, look, hey, we're here, we're talking, I'm listening, I'm expecting this one really important email. Uh, if I see that come in or, you know, if, you, if, if I check my phone in a few minutes, I hope you don't mind. Um, it's just really urgent, but otherwise I'm so glad you're here with me today. This is really great. And just acknowledging that person and their importance in your life. I th it can speak volumes. The other one is to think about device-free meetings. So, you know, at Google, we get a mix of times where people bring in their devices or they don't. You know, we often try to encourage people to at least close your laptop so that we can tell that you're not kind of off, distracted by something else. Um, but even having a, a device-free meeting, there was a company that, that suggested that people come in on a Saturday, which I know this is sounding a little crazy and, and everybody wants their free time, but coming in on a Saturday and, and actually having a no talking day <laughs> where you almost take a vow of silence and just kind of go inside yourself and just work on what you need to, but just sort of quietly and being internal and mindful about your own well-being. Now, I know this sounds kind of radical and maybe doesn't work in every case, um, but the idea of a device-free meeting where you're really encouraging people to, to share their ideas, to be vocal about something, you know, rather than, again, kind of lose themselves into that screen, um, can be a really great way of building that teamwork, of getting people out of their shell a little bit. You know, I think that it can be a crutch all too often for people who are a bit shy, or maybe do, don't do so well in business meeting situations, and I am not great in those situations either. Sometimes I don't feel like I want to run the meeting and you know, I lead some teams, but I want to let them talk and let them have their moments in the sun. And if they're all on their devices, it's hard to kind of have it be de democratic that way because everybody's kind of in and out of their attention span. Uh, this one, I think, can benefit you for a lot of different reasons. I don't think I have to spell them out, but it can also give you this kind of time away from your technology. So... I, we, my wife and I, we have no smartphone charging in the bedroom. It's a, it's a device-free zone, if you will. Now, it's the only room, well, I don't have that many rooms, uh, but it's the only place in our apartment where that happens. You know, well, sure, we're on the you know, smartphone, wherever it is, but they're charged in the kitchen or in the living room or somewhere away from the bedroom. And, you know, I know that a smartphone makes a great alarm clock and, you know, it's handy to have right there and so on. But allowing yourself that little bit of space between being so caught up in the binary bits and bytes and everything that's going on, you know, if you, if you charge it in the kitchen or in another room, I promise you it might take 30 seconds 
to get from your bed to the device, you're not going to miss out on everything that's going on in the world. I realize that there are acronyms these days like FOMO or fear of missing out, right? We all kind of have this sense of like, uh-oh, if I'm away from my device for a bit, I'm not going to know some bit of news or some stock price that changed or some deal that's happening. The fact is, life will go on, but giving yourself that little bit of a break, have coffee, have your tea, you know, and then check your phone. And the same at night, just feel like that's an opportunity to kind of disconnect for a bit. And setting those rules for yourself, acknowledging that you can have rules for yourself, I think is an important step. You know, all too often we just kind of have a scatterbrained, half-assed way of, you know, using our technology. Like, oh, I guess I got to check my phone all the time. Like, I try to have my own e-day. So I think about when I am not really connected anymore. And maybe it's 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. Whatever it is, at some point, I just kind of say, I, I'm done. And especially if my kids are expecting my attention or my wife is trying to talk to me or whatever it is, you know, taking control over your technology can make you feel better about it. So you don't feel like it's running your life which I know we all kind of feel that way sometimes. The other thing that you can do in terms of just a little stress relief and kind of, look, we all use our thumbs and fingers and everything else to kind of, kind of keep up with what's going on in the world, but getting a tennis ball and squeezing it in your hand once in a while can actually relieve a lot of pressure. I've talked to some doctors about this and they see tons of patients folks like yourself and me probably, who come in and really just kind of feel stressed out and, and, and have actual physical problems from this. And so using a tennis ball to just squeeze it once in a while at work or in the office can be a great way to relieve that. The opposite is with an elastic band that you just put around your fingers and spread them out that way. Um, it can maybe even allow you to type faster. <laughs> no, I am not. Um, but it can be a, a really handy way and you know this is cheap and easy just have them in the drawer at work and, and give yourself this opportunity to kind of just relax a bit. You know, I mean, I can tell everybody in this room is, is, you know, very motivated. I can already tell you're all very focused. This is great. But, you know, we all need that opportunity to just let ourselves chill out a bit and having that sort of mindfulness approach with technology, which it doesn't always allow us to do. Um, and this is, again, the kind of stuff that I talk about you know, with doctors who see an increasing number of patients who have this as a problem. Um, this is not just some small corner of the world. This is something that's, that's such a part of our society. There is also, um, in the fourth part of the digital diet, by the way, which is called, re is called reconnect, we'll just reconnect and then rethink uh, and reboot. And the idea of the last part of the book is that there is actually a lot of technology out there to help you manage your technology. I know this sounds impossible, but it's true. Um, there are apps out there that can give you uh, a sort of a, a healthy quote throughout the day that will track where you are. You know, a lot of wearable technology these days, like the Fitbit or the Jawbone Up. You know, these are great ways to, to track your steps and get some biofeedback, right? I mean, this is where a lot of uh, people are looking at in the tech space, not just wearable technology, but what is that, what is that wearable technology telling you about you that you don't know? It could be your heart rate, it could be the steps you've taken, the calories you've burned, the food you've eaten, the sleep that you got or didn't get. You know, all of this is, is useful as you make decisions in your life. No one's going to do this for you, but it can be a way to be empowered with information. There's also this program called Rescue Time which is, is able to look at where you've spent your time online, which sites you visited for how long, break it down into different charts and pie graphs, and it can suggest to you where, where you know, am I being productive today? You know, I think we've all had a day or lots of days where we think, what did I do today? You know, I lost these hours of my life and I have no idea what I was doing. And this will actually give you that feedback and that information. So if you're working on a particular project and you want to know, or your clients are, or whatever it is, you can actually see where this time is spent on the internet. And I think that can be a really amazing illumination of where your time is going in a productivity sense. If you really need help, then it can actually cut off the internet for a certain period of time so that you can just focus on whatever you're doing. 
is I think sometimes the, the tendency is, of course, we're distracted, it's a temptation sort of thing, and to know that it's not there, to force yourself out of that for a bit, can allow you to have that kind of clarity of mind. And this is the kind of stuff that all fits into the idea of multitasking, which is something that I look at quite a bit in the book and talk to a number of researchers about. And I'm going to ask you all a question here, and I'm curious to see what the answer is going to be. How many people here would describe themselves as a good multitasker? Show of hands. Good at multitasking. Okay. How many people aren't, aren't good at multitasking? How many people hate multitasking? Okay. So, the fact is, the research that, that's being done shows that even if you like to multitask or think that you're good at it, you're not. <laughs> the brain, the human brain, is really only good at doing two, maybe three things at the same time. Now, forgetting about walking and chewing gum, but the idea that you have... 20 tabs open on your screen and you have phone call coming in and emails and your phone is vibrating and you're sort of trying to remember what it was you did 10 minutes ago and what should I do for lunch. You know, all this stuff is coming at you very quickly. And the research that's being done is looking at can we cope with this? And at the moment, no. You know, an example might be, and I'm assuming that many of you here are at least bilingual, if not more so, and they've, they've done studies where they ask somebody who's bilingual to change languages mid-sentence, so to go from German to French or English to Japanese or something, and even people who are really bilingual have difficulty with this. They struggle with it, and that's part of what's happening here, is that the brain is trying to switch gears and move into that other realm, and it struggles. Now, the same goes with when information comes at you. The other thing that, gets, that happens is you actually lose productivity. Four hours a day, roughly, are lost because people are trying to multitask ineffectively. You're actually not getting done what you think you're getting done. It's completely counterintuitive because when you see your screen or when you're working on your computer or you're doing all sorts of different things, your mind in some ways convinces you that this is how it should be done and this is working. But it's not. So, Thinking about that in a more effective way can benefit you, and I'm not suggesting that we all do one thing at a time and go through life in a linear fashion. You know, obviously, we all have to kind of deal with this stuff in different ways, and we have a lot of information coming at us. And some days, we simply have to try to multitask. But being aware of that, and so much of the message of, of the book and what I talk about is awareness. So just being aware of when you feel like I'm not being as productive through multitasking. And I do this a lot. There are days when I think, you know what, I, I really have just got to look away from my computer. I need to go for a walk. I need to go get something to eat. I need to just kind of step away for a bit or I am not going to accomplish what it is that I want to do. And I think that it's the kind of thing that can have a ripple effect in whatever else it is that you're trying to do in your life. So the, the sort of final idea of, of all of this is that, you know, loving your technology, embracing it, using it, harnessing its power for whatever it is that you're doing from a business standpoint or a personal standpoint, all of this can be done, but just not unconditionally. So thinking about having those parameters, those rules, thinking critically from a business standpoint, what's working, what's not for my company? What's working, what's not for me? You know, not just rushing to get all of the latest and greatest stuff because there's plenty of that out there. You know, I, I see it all the time. I see a lot of companies that make the mistake of implementing a new system simply because they read about it somewhere and think that it might work for them, but not going through the motions of testing it out effectively, of understanding how it would work for them, you know, of really doing it in a way that makes sense. So there is a way to love your technology and just not do it unconditionally. Um, I will, I'm just going to read out a few things from the, from the book here to, to, as I leave you here to think about. Um, and, and this will help you to understand if you maybe need to be part of a digital diet. So do you sometimes feel the urge to pull out your smartphone when someone else is making a point in conversation? Yeah? 
a few people? Have you ever realized that you were texting while your child was telling you about her day at school and later couldn't remember any details of the story? Now, this can be hugely detrimental in a business sense if someone is talking to you about something that they're working on and you can't remember anything because you're so distracted by everything that's coming at you. Have you ever felt like something hasn't really happened yet before you posted about it on social media? Now, this is something I see with a lot of young people who feel like they can't possibly just enjoy an experience. They have to actually post about it and see the world through their screens and then later experience it. And I hope that people don't get too caught up in that world. Uh, do you sometimes wonder if you could actually focus better in real life before all these gadgets invaded our space? So what was that like 10, 15 years ago, before Wi-Fi, before smartphones? You know, were you any better at whatever it is that you're doing today? How is it making you better? Does a flashing light on your smartphone trump everything else that's going on around you and force you to look at it? Has looking left and right given way to looking up and down as you walk along a sidewalk and try to avoid bumping into the other person? Do you often see the back of your child or spouse's or the top of their head silhouetted against the glow of a video game? Do you feel anxious if you're offline for any period of time? Do you know you shouldn't be texting and driving, but of course still do it, as I talked about earlier? And do you find that your family can all be in the same room, but not talking to one another because you're interacting with a different device? And there's a, there's a joke going around that if you actually want to call a family meeting, uh, all you need to do is turn off the Wi-Fi and go sit in the room where the router is, and within a few minutes, everybody will show up to try to find out what's wrong. Now, the other thing you can do if your kids are totally connected and you wonder how to kind of shake them out of it once in a while, uh, you can promise them the Wi-Fi password if they do their homework, maybe do the laundry, then they can have the Wi-Fi password. Because I get some parents who tell me, well, my kids, they just text each other. It's like they never come out of their room. They text mom and dad from their room to the kitchen. They don't come down for meals. It's like they don't exist anymore. And I say, that's a problem. <laughs> like, you know, I, I get that it's the next generation and kids are using this stuff, but if you don't see your children anymore, you're not talking to them, and then you want to go out and have dinner with them, and they're all buried in their devices, well, you know, that's the monster you created, right? And so, you know, with my oldest daughter, who's three, just a little over three, you know, we try to give her a limited time on her tablet, well, it's not her tablet, it's the family tablet, but she gets to play a couple of games and watch some shows, but we think of it for her as special time. It's an opportunity for her to use that device. It's not, it's not assumed, it's not taken for granted, it's something that she has for a while and then she doesn't have it anymore. And it doesn't always work and sometimes she says, oh, daddy, I wanna play with it more, um, but we try to keep it at, to a minimum. Now, the opposite of that are the parents, and I know quite a few, who just give their devices to their kids, like a sort of digital babysitter, and then when they go to take it away, this child has a total meltdown. And I've seen kids who bang on walls to get their device back. They're so distraught. You'd think that you're watching some sort of strange animal, but all they did was say, no more time on the iPad which you know, maybe they'd been using already for two or three hours, and then they took it away. Now, you have to wonder, what is this doing? And you know, how is this gonna affect this child as they grow up, their social skills, their ability to interact with people? You know, the point of all of this is that a lot of our human interaction and a lot of our human needs to belong to a community, to talk to people, to feel like you belong, that hasn't changed. What's changed is the way that we can get to that, or the way that we access that. So it used to be that a community meant physically being with people in a tribe, right? We look back at historical times. People were physically in a, in, a, in a tribe. Then it was physically in a town. You know, you felt like you belonged to a community. Well, then towns got bigger, and they were cities, and people were spread out, and you had little communities, pockets of communities. And then along came, of course, the internet, and the web, and devices, and smartphones, and pretty soon, 
we could go way outside of our communities. In fact, we could build communities all over the world. We didn't have to worry about whether they were physical proximity. And so instead of worrying about the people in our immediate sphere, or the people who are right here, like we are all in this room, you could start worrying about the people who are in a sphere way beyond you. But is that at the expense of the people that are in that immediate sphere? And that's the kind of thing that I think is increasingly going to become a discussion, whether it's in the business world, in, the, in psychology, but physically what it's doing to us, neurology, technologists, you know, they're all looking at this as an issue and what it means to our society. It's not going away, and I don't want to suggest that any of us are trying to stop the flow of technology, but I think that as we look forward, as we look to the next five, 10 years, wearable technology, gesture-based technology, uh, voice commands, you know, all of this is just becoming kind of second nature to us. You know, what is that doing to our identity? And I don't want to see people forget about what that means to be human. And I think that with, especially with social media, and I fell victim to this, I created what I called my digital Adonis, the, the version of me that I wanted everybody to kind of see and know through social media. And the fact is it wasn't really true. You know, a lot of the pictures that I posted were all happy, smiling, everything seemed great in my life. Well, of course, the reality is that that wasn't what was going on. But I projected this image of myself for the world to see, and that's what a lot of people who maybe didn't know me very well, that's what they saw. Now, that wasn't real, though. So what, what was real? <laughs> and I had a real problem struggling with, with this kind of an identity crisis. And I think that's something that a lot of young people today are increasingly seeing. You know, what is real? Who are they really? Are they defined by their digital persona? How, how much of that is okay? You know, yes, that is a part of their life, but what's the emphasis? So all of this is being factored into those kinds of decisions that are being made today, the way that we interact with our technology, the way that we use it, and the way that it can be abused as well. So I, I would love to take some, some questions uh, from people. Um, if you have some thoughts or some things you want to throw at me here, I know that... Um, Ellen is, is available to moderate. Um, so feel free to shout Any them out. Any questions, just raise your hand. We have microphones ready. I certainly have a question. Okay. Because one of your assistants actually told me in the run-up to this event that uh, gave me your contact details and said I could call you. And if you wouldn't pick up the phone, I should just shoot you an email. You'd usually respond right away unless you were sleeping or on a plane. <laughs> So yes. that poses a question, how's your own digital diet actually going? Yes. I didn't test it, so you still have the chance very to say good it's question. all very different. Very good question. I do respond fairly quickly on email, and I think that the advice I give people is if you can knock out that email in 30 seconds, then maybe it's better to do that at the time, as long as you're not obviously interrupting anything else around you. But if you can do that in a way that allows you to move on and do whatever else it is that you're doing, then I think that's worth doing. If it's an email that's gonna take you a few minutes and you wanna craft it and, and sort of be a little thoughtful about it, then wait and, and do it later. So my, my own digital diet, I would say that uh, I have lost a lot of the digital diet <laughs> weight that I had before I started it. Um, I am not, I am not, I don't think anybody's perfect. And I think that there are things that I'm constantly sort of improving and tweaking here and there. Of course, because I work at Google, I get an opportunity to see a lot of different technologies that are going on. So I'm kind of in a unique position that way, but I also have to be careful with my kids as they start to get older. It was different four years ago before I had kids. I didn't really think as much about it, um, but I think that it's, it's changed the way that I think about technology in my life. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting now that uh, airlines sometimes allow you to use your devices uh, on planes. I actually heard a lot of negative feedback from people who are on planes. We're right. like, oh God, well, you know, the only time we usually have to have a break. Right, <laughs> and I guess on long haul flights, on international flights, you still don't often have that opportunity, but domestically in the US, just about every carrier has some sort of internet access on the plane, and you're right. Some people complain about it, others see it as an opportunity to be productive because they're in their own little space. 
Um, actually, Nick Bilton, who's a writer at the New York Times who covers technology, made a big push to the FCC, the, the, the regulatory commissions in the US, to allow people to have their devices during the takeoff and landing. So for you know, a long time, you had to put those away, and then you could take them out when the plane reached 10,000 feet. And he, said, he fought for people to have them out throughout the course of the ride, as long as they didn't have the internet turned on, hmm. um, because it was determined that there really was no safety concern here. And now the big fight for people is to try to get that internet access even below 10,000 feet. Oh, so <laughs> you, know, you have to wonder, you know, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, are you disturbing everyone around you? And if you're making a phone call, there are people who just say, like, shut up, please pick up your phone, you know? So it, it does depend on you know, whatever it is is important to you. Hmm. Yeah. Now what you're wearing doesn't exactly look like a pair of uh, Google glasses. I right. wonder how your boss would feel about <laughs> it. <laughs> but well, joke aside, how long is it going to take, you think, until you or other people in the audience will wear them just like they wear jackets or ties? Yeah, well, I mean, so Google Glass is, um, I, it, it, it's, I do have a, a, a pair, and I do wear them quite a bit. Um, they're quite a not bit like during the day for several hours? Or yeah, hard, hard sometimes. I mean, it, it, and, and in terms of the sort of digital diet fitting into Google Glass, you know, <laughs> one of the things that we talk about with Glass is that it gives you information quickly, and then you can move on to whatever else that you were doing. So it's not meant for you know, sitting and watching a movie, for example. You know, you're really getting an email or a text. You can respond quickly and kind of move on. And that's part of the premise around it. Um, for me, I don't wear it in public a lot because I get a lot of questions about it. <laughs> and because I also do a lot of speaking for Google, sometimes I just want to take off my Google hat for a bit and just be out in the world. Um, and the other thing is that obviously I wear glasses. There are prescription versions of it coming. Um, but I think if, if anyone here is interested in glass, I can, I can talk more about it too. But um, you know, the evolution of that in terms of coming into our life, I would say that you know, we've talked about releasing it to consumers sometime later this year. That's the last thing that we've sort of, the most recent thing that we've said about it. Um, I think it's going to start in the US. And then we will see you know, how does that go. Right now, it's in the hands of roughly, I think it's about 10,000 of our Google Glass explorers. Uh, and we've opened that up even more to people who want to buy it. Um, but we're taking cues from developers. You know, we've seen, for example, surgeons who are wearing it in the operating room, and you know, they're able to transmit back to other people what they're oh, really? what they're doing. Uh, there's a teacher who's worn glass um, and taken it to a zoo and let kids in another school see what was happening at the zoo. So there's a lot of kind of remote access to to activities, of course, for you know. Uh, Adrenaline junkies, they might be wearing it if they're, you know, jumping out of a plane or, you know, whatever it is that they want to show people that they're doing. Um, so lots of applications and, you know, I'm excited about where it's going. Mm. Yeah. But you can also pretend to have eye contact in a meeting <laughs> and you are, in fact, reading your emails, right? right? I mean, I guess, <laughs> the, I guess the argument is are, if you're wearing something like Google Glass and you're tapping the side of this, am I, is that more distracting to the person that you're with? Is that better than like pulling out your phone and looking away? You know, how do we manage that influx of information that comes in and do it in a way that's respectful of the people around you, but doesn't forget, of course, about the immediacy and the need to get that information very quickly. And I think, you know, wearable technology, that's part of where this is going, that, you know, we, we want that very I was quickly. actually going to yeah. ask, this picture of us very impressive, um, the Pope picture. Yeah. Um, eight years difference. Yeah. So what is it going to look like in eight years from now? Yeah, I mean, I, that's a great question. I think that you maybe you won't see so many screens being held up because it may be done in a because more subtle glasses. way or they're being worn mm -hmm. in some way. Um, you know, I think that, that I hope that, that the idea of wearing it or not holding up a screen, I mean, I've seen, you know, you see people who hold up, you know, or even this is a small iPad, but somebody who has a big iPad and they hold it up like this in front of their face when they're at a, a concert or an mm -hmm. event and they're like, just put it aside for a little while. Just look at the concert and don't feel like you have to do that for everything. Um, so maybe the subtlety of wearing a device like that will allow you to appreciate the event a bit more and not feel so compelled to put a barrier almost between you and the experience. Mm, it's like you uh, hear less ringtones nowadays, right? Because people You're actually right. realize that, they, that it's rather impolite. Exactly. It's a very nice development that People usually have it on silent wherever they are. I would love to see the the uh, line graph of the ringtone.
prophets over the last 10 years, I'm sure that they've dropped off because it used to be kind of a novelty to get different ringtones, but these days it's very rare to hear this kind of obnoxious ringtone, especially in a business setting, but mm. it's either vibrate or silent for most people. And I think you're right, it speaks to that trend of wanting to, yes, have that information, but being more aware of the people around you and not interrupting them in that way. Hmm. Any more or any questions now, or do you all want to save them for later? Because we will hear more about you, luckily, later in our round table. Mm -hmm. For now, thank you oh, very much. Okay. And is oh, is there one? Yeah. What do you think the virtual yeah, bring the microphone, oh, please, sure. so everyone can. Just wondering why, or whether you agree that social etiquette is very slow to catch up with technology. You know that you have things that are basically rude. You all cower behind your laptops. People sit on the on the trains and the tubes with their earphones blaring, and there doesn't seem to be any social rules around that. Or do you see those evolving, or are we all just getting ever more selfish and <laughs> technology enables that? Yeah, I mean, I I hope that it's. I think that it's catching up to a certain degree. I think that. Part of it is that we all rush to embrace a lot of the different technologies that have happened over the last several years, smartphones and social media and a lot of the things that distract us. And we forgot about social etiquette, I think, along the way. And part of the reason for that is it's so, the powerful effect it has on our brain. And you know, in the book I talk about being addicted to technology and there are people who would argue that the nerve centers or the parts of the brain that get that kind of feedback, it's like a drug. It's, it's like being uh, addicted to some sort of drug. Now, not as bad as, you know, obviously heroin or some sort of, you know, awful drug like that, but the pleasure centers of the brain and that desire to be wanted or part of a community are very, very strong. And unfortunately, maybe at the expense of social etiquette and people around us, but now I think there's, a, there's more of a sense that, well, hang on a second, you know, we need to kind of push back a little bit and, and, and be better at it. And people are not afraid to call someone out on it. You know, it used to be that I think people just let it go. These days people are just like, come on, dude, put your phone down. Mm -hmm. You know, it, there's, a, there's a, better, a stronger sense that that's okay, that there's permission to kind of talk about it a bit more. I hope. <laughs> okay, great. Danny, we're going to hear more. All right. From you later on in the round table for now. Thank you very much. All right. Thank and you all. Thank a great you. applause, Thank please, you. for Daniel Seberg from Google. Hmm. Right, and now you uh, can actually prove that you learned something this past hour by resisting the temptation to pull out your phones while we take a 15 minute break. Uh, but of course, you can satisfy some other addictions. There is coffee outside, <laughs> sweets are also ready. And we'll reconvene here in 15 minutes to hear from someone who supports companies for a better understanding of digital communications platforms like weblogs, forums, and social networks. So see you then in 15 minutes. <laughs>